Um, before uh, we start, I just want to announce that the meeting is being taped, recorded, and uh, obviously we are meeting remotely. This is the Monday, August 8th, a meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And um, we always start these meetings with public comment. And I just wanted to state that um, the public comment to be to directed to any items that are not already on the agenda. So I, number, I know probably a number of you are interested in the St. John Canius project that is later on the agenda. So we're gonna hold off any com comments on that project until then. But if there are any other comments that um, individuals would like to make on items that are not on the agenda, we'd be happy to hear them. And if you do want to do that, please uh, state your name and your address. And if you uh, signal either using the hand symbol or visually, we can uh, call on you. And it doesn't look like we do. Uh, Martha, so Claudia Lefko has her hand up. Okay. Um, I don't see Claudia Lefko on my screen, but um, if you're out there, Claudia, <laughs> and you would like to state yeah. your name and your address, um, yes. oh, there you are. Okay. There I am. There I am. Hi, Claudia Lefko. Can you hear me? Yes. You hear, you hear me? Yes, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I'm commenting. Um, I'm commenting on a concern I have about the consultants that have been hired um, in the planning department who will be looking at some in, things, including historic preservation. And the reason for my concern is because over the last months, we've been in touch with Historic Northampton about issues in our neighborhood. And it seemed Historic Northampton has been getting also some uh, phone calls from other areas in the city um, from people who wonder about how we're going to conserve our neighborhood. And they wrote to the planning department, to Wayne and to Carolyn Mish, and, um, and had some ideas for them about preserving neighborhoods and how they might work with historic Northampton to do this. Um, and, you know, Wayne's response, and I know Wayne won't be there, was that, you know, they are not going to let the uh, this, the I forget what the consultant's name is, but they're not going to let them comment or or have a, a response to how their work might impact uh, what's happening in neighborhoods vis-a-vis -vis zoning even so that they think of this as a separate issue that even though it's going to look at historic uh, regulations and so forth that they don't want it and so I guess and I can send the the committee this letter maybe I should have sent it in advance but my concern is that you know we've spent this money to hire a consulting firm and that we're going to already box them in in terms of what they can look at and what they can recommend and I'm just hoping the historic commission you all might take a look at this and reassure us that that is not going to happen, that the consultants actually will have some free range, especially as this is such a big issue in the city. So that, that's my point, and um, thanks. Thank you, Claudia. Anybody else have any comments they would like to make? If there are any hands that I can't see because I see a lot of names and no hands or faces, uh, I apologize. But um, is it Deborah? Yes. But, but we're, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning. Are we not commenting on, are we supposed to comment on things on the agenda now or wait until we reach that point in the agenda? We'll wait until we reach that point in the agenda. Thanks. Okay, if there are no other public comments, um, I have a brief chair's report uh, for Harvey and Barbara, <laughs> but we'll pass this on to the other members too. Um, we uh, just wanted to note that the roof on the church, uh, the former um, Blessed Sacrament Church, now um, Seventh-day Adventist Church, is progressing. Um, and if you haven't been up there to look at it, 
um, please do. Barbara, I hope that your concern about reflectivity is um, reflection, reflectiveness is being um, taken care of. <laughs> yeah, I actually went by there the other day and noticed okay. that it, it certainly does not seem like a bright reflective surface at all. So I okay. think it actually looks pretty good. Great, good. Um, also in the district, I know there is one property for sale at the moment. So um, we have our um, radar out. And also I think Sarah's uh, had planned to contact the realtor that's representing that, who is a former chair of the commission. So um, we hopefully will get the information to whoever buys that property uh, so they know that they are part of uh, something that's larger, larger than just their own home. I was just going to comment on the preservation plan um, that is in process. There was a submittal made um, uh, to basically um, be able to use some of this existing grant funding to uh, get a beginning portion of the project going. Um, the public process for that project is going to be taking place in the fall. So. Barbara, you're on the subcommittee with me and Steve. Um, so we'll be getting together and talking about that um, as they develop their plans for that. Um, I also just wanted to mention Harvey and Barbara, there are a number of Mass Historical Commission um, workshops coming up for historic uh, commission members. And um, you can get that information off the Mass Historical Commission website. Um, Sarah probably could also forward that information to you because it was on the list to serve. Um, but there's some great, they're virtual and um, they're very informative if you are, you know, want to brush up on your preservation skills. And then finally, um, we are, we have lost two commission members. I think you both know that, um, uh, you know, Craig has resigned and is not continuing. And Jonathan unfortunately had to resign um, just recently and will not be rejoining us. So I'm just saying, if you have um, ideas about individuals who you think would be um, interested and good participants, good contributors, um, please encourage them to submit application to uh, the mayor's office. And that's an online application, as you probably remember, Harvey especially. Okay. Uh, we have two sets of minutes to approve. Um, the first from January 3rd and the second from January 31st. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look through these. Um, I, I did. Um, and even though it was a while ago, they seemed accurate. So I would um, make a motion to approve them as submitted. And I would second that motion. Okay, all right, great. Um, any more discussion about them? They look fine to me as well, so. Um. All right, so uh, roll call vote for that. Harvey? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. All right. Uh, so we will open the public hearing officially. It's 5.39, and this, uh, the subject of this hearing is um, St. John's Episcopal Church on Elm Street, uh, which has had um, cell service, cell towers, what do you want to call them, um, on the building since 2007, I believe. And um, they are wanting to upgrade that equipment and put in new transmitters and um, relocate them. Um, do we have the applicant here? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, um, Adam Braylard uh, of Prince Laval Thai for, for the applicant T-Mobile. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, so normally in these situations, it would be great to have just a bit of an overview. And Sarah, I don't know if the drawings are available um, for this, that you could share with us? Yeah, give me, uh, give okay. me a minute and I'll throw those up on the screen. Okay, great. 
So Ben, if you just wanted to give the commission members a overview of what you're proposing here, we did get all the materials, um, the drawings and elevations were very helpful um, going through them. I appreciate the presentation. It was very well put together. Um, so if you have anything you would like to share with us to give us an overview, that would be great. Um, thank you very much. And again, um, members of the commission, uh, we appreciate you uh, having a quorum. I know it's been, it's been uh, tricky the past couple of weeks. So uh, we appreciate that. Again, uh, my name is Adam Braylard. I'm with a firm um, that the applicant T-Mobile hires to do a lot of their permitting work. Um, my firm's called Prince Lavelle Ty. Also with me is, um, or here tonight is Ryan Ramos. Ryan is with T-Mobile's radio frequency department um, to, to answer any questions that the, uh, uh, the commission and the public may have uh, as to the need. Um, and also with me is Sean um, Mullen. Sean is with uh, a company called Transcend, which is a site acquisition or project management company on behalf of T-Mobile that um, works with myself and with Ryan and with T-Mobile and with the property owner to, uh, to kind of pull all this, this together. Um, so as um, Madam Chairman said, we are, T-Mobile is proposing to um, modify its existing wireless communications facility on the um, top or on the church um, bell tower here at, um, at 48 Elm Street, um, which requires two, two types or two, it's basically a two step process here. One is to work with the um, historic commission and uh, obtain a certificate of appropriateness. And the second is then to work with the planning department and the planning board and obtain a site plan approval or modification of a, of a site plan approval. Both of those uh, approvals were obtained in 2017, uh, sorry, 2007, 2007 and 2008. So nothing has really been done with the site since then. And the, you know, the reason for the modification is to really bring the, the site up to, up to speed, up to the 5G requirements and needs of the, uh, of the customers for, uh, for coverage and capacity. Um, I think what, what, I, what I can do now is kind of go through what the, what the proposal is. And maybe the easiest way to do that is to actually look at the photo sims from, from the beginning. Um, this may not be the first sim, I think there's probably one or two more. Yep, I think this is the first photo sim. So this is a, um, let me just make sure. Yep, this is the first photo sim. So this is a shot in existing this is an existing conditions. This shows the um, shot of uh, the, I want to make sure I have my, my azimuth correct, the gamma sector. So currently on site, there's, there's three total panel antennas, one per sector. Um, and, and overall, what T-Mobile is proposing to do is- Well, how do you uh, get the sound up? Oh, want me to speak a little louder? Can you, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so what, what T-Mobile is proposing to do is, is replace you, those. Yes. Okay. Well, that's fine. It's too quiet. Well, I should have done the sound. First. So if people are, um, could you please mute yourselves because we're getting some background noise and Adam's trying to make a presentation. Thank you. So um, thank you. There's three, existing antennas, one per sector, so three sectors, panel antennas. And Timo is proposing to, to um, replace those with three new like kind um, panel antennas and also add one panel antenna per sector. So a total of three new antennas or a total of three additional antennas, so a total of six antennas. So if you look at the same um, view, we propose to install two antennas on the gamma side on the left, um, uh, which would be uh, set on the um, facade of the, of the wall of the um, tower. And then two on the alpha sector, which is facing toward the right, um, that uh, would 
would also uh, would account for the uh, sorry would account for the alpha or I'm sorry the beta sector. So those would also be painted to match the color and texture of the uh, existing facade, which is a, a stone um, stone finish. So the intent is that there would be no uh, significant change in the uh, in the aesthetics of the of the church and the tower. And then if you keep going down, I think we have a couple other views. So this is an existing um, view uh, from the looking east at the tower. So the, I think this is the back of the, the church. Mm -hmm. And those are the existing antennas that are on the existing chimney. And we're proposing to reduce the height of those and put those on the, there's the, there's the proposed locations on the top of the, of the uh, tower. Um, again, in front of the, the stone finish and those would be again painted to match the color. And I say texture because um, you know what we've done in the past, what T-Mobile has done in the past, is not only paint the antennas, but also include like the grout lines. In the event that that's the, the way that the um, the town or the city would would like that to um, to look, so we're able to do that as well. So this is a view showing what the proposed antenna locations would look like. And I think there's another set of um, Photo settings as well. Yep, so this is an, this is another shot of the uh, Bell uh, Tower looking west. That's the existing antenna that's hanging off the um, existing chimney. And the next proposed, those are the antennas that would um, be on the facade of the of the, of the Bell Tower. And that that even shows some uh, shadowing there, but uh, I, I think that that's. That's just to show, you know, to, to actually point it out a little bit um, in, in greater detail for you. The, I think that's it for the photo sims. The only other changes to this, th that's really the only change from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, T-Mobile does have an existing um, equipment uh, room inside or within the first or second floor of the church. Uh, and the chain, the, the dimensions of that will not change, but there will be some additional radio um, units or equipment that would be installed inside that um, radio, uh, inside that equipment room. There also will be some what we call remote radio units or, or RRUs that would be installed up on top um, of the bell tower, but inside that uh, uh, that kind of gated area, so those would not be visible as well. So aside from that, that's really the change. Again, we're we're really trying to upgrade this um, uh, this installation or this site to be consistent with what the needs are um, for for T-Mobile's customers in the vicinity. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, before we discuss this, I just wanted to uh, read for the record. Um, Harvey and Bobby probably have already read this, but I'll read it for the record. Uh, the design standards guidelines for uh, introducing modern equipment, um, such as cellular facilities, which is what we're dealing with. Um, modern equipment shall in general be as small and inconspicuous as possible. All modern equipment shall be installed in locations which create the least disturbance to the historical appearance of the building involve the fewest additional structural alterations and are screen hidden or otherwise shielded from view to the greatest extent possible. And then secondly, modern equipment shall not be placed in front of the principal building on the site and shall be screened ad adequately. Um, and then this goes on. So uh, we, we're essentially two parameters here. Um, one of the questions I had, Adam, is the these will be projecting how far off of the building? Yeah, let me check. I'm just looking at the okay. plans just to see what the what the mount uh, the distance. Um, that the mount would be from the facade of the building. So while we're looking for that, um, Harvey or Barbara, do you have any questions for Adam? 
Well, I don't have questions, but I can comment on the, after looking at the plans and the, you know, the, well, the drawings of, of what uh, the new antenna would look like. It seemed to me that it's possible there actually be less visible, less obtrusive than the other ones were because um, of where they're placed and the fact that they will be uh, toned and textured to um, not really uh, stand out too much from the stone. So it seemed to me in some ways, even though there are more of them, they're, they seem they're, they're not as high. They don't, um, they just seem less visible where they're placed because they're not at the very top of the tower. And it seemed like even when I've driven by, you can, you can really see them because they're beige as opposed to really a darker color or closer to the color of the building. So this seemed like it could be visually an improvement. Mm -hmm. That was my impression as well. Okay. Adam, did you come up with that figure? I, I, I don't see it in the plans. Um, okay. I thought maybe ask Ryan um, what our standard set off is. I think it's probably a, a, um, within a foot. Oh, okay. All right. um, but, it, but it may be 18 inches to the foot. Okay, I just was curious about the um, how much um, uh, just um, um, shadowing we might get from them. But sure. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that. Um, I think that this is going to be a visual improvement, even though there are more of the, more of them and um, the way they're set down um, in a vertical manner that's reflective of the balustrade or um, whatever we want to call it that goes around the tower, I think is a really good compliment. Um, I think this is also, um, a situation where um, the church benefits from this from a financial point of view and the community benefits from it because we use the transmitters. <laughs> All of us, I'm sure we do. So um, it seems like kind of a win-win. <clears throat> uh, any other comments, Harvey or Barbara? Okay. Nope. Um, I think we're ready to vote on this. Um, can I take a motion? I move to approve it, the proposal. I, I would second that. This is to issue a certificate of appropriateness. Is yeah. that right? Okay. Yes, yes, I would second that. And then the only discussion I would have is, um, Adam, mm -hmm. it's more of a question and maybe a request. Uh, when you do actually paint these, um, is there any way for uh, the staff of the city to uh, be able to look at a sample before everything is all done to make sure that the blending is right, the color is right, and the texture is right? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, in the short answers, I think so. Um, I, I wouldn't want to promise anything um, that uh, hasn't been promised before. I know we do have site plan approval with the planning board, mm -hmm. um, but what um, I think what we, we can try to figure figure something out. I don't want to be vague either, um, but but I, I um, I'm wondering if the antennas and, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but the antennas would be painted before they're installed, correct? Yeah. So maybe what we can do is work with the city and the town and the, uh, the, the historic mm -hmm. commission, and probably planning as well, and prior to those being installed. But after painted, um, notify notify the folks in, uh, at the, uh, the the commission here. That's okay. what we could do. Yeah, I mean this the planning board may require that, or at least require some kind of a submittal on it. Is I guess I would say mm -hmm. before it goes up. I I can't answer that, but um, so that would be my only concern. Okay. Okay, Adam? Sarah. I think we're ready to vote. Uh, all right, uh, so roll call vote, Harvey. And I support it, yes. All right, Barbara. Yes. And Martha. Yes. All right, unanimous. Okay, so we come to Saint, the St. John Cantius project. Um, there is a request in front of the commission to support the Community Preservation Act application that was made in the last round um to um provide funding to secure the envelope of the building and 
I wanted to just uh, announce to everybody, remind everybody what our charge is here tonight. Um, I think there may be a little bit of confusion, probably not on the part of the commissioners, but maybe the public that um, we are actually charged with financing this, with approving the funding and the historical commission does not do that. Um, it is the community preservation committee that does that. We would um, voice support or um, not and with or withhold support for this um, and that information would go on to the community preservation committee to make their decision but um, we are not in control of um, money um, so we're basically looking at two things tonight <laughs> one is um, the commission is going to be looking what looking and deciding as to whether they support the work uh, which is being proposed in the CPA application uh, being requested. And in order to make that decision um, on the part of the commission, I think as well as the CPC, um, the CPC requested the historic structures report be prepared, which has been completed. And we've all, the commissioners have been able to review that ahead of the meeting. So we um, thank you for that. And then the second is, uh, does this commission support uh, the notion, the concept um, of a preservation restriction that would be held um, likely permanently? <clears throat> and the commission would then be acting on behalf of this, the city in any future reviews um, of the exterior of the building, any changes to um, assure that any changes are in compliance with the restriction. <clears throat> And the restriction terms would be negotiated between the owner and Mass Historical Commission. So those are just some pieces of information that we all need to know um, in order to make this decision. Um, we will take some public comment in the, on this. And I want to just say we did receive over 40, well, I should say I received over 40 uh, communications about this. There may be additional. Um, I'm not sure about that, Sarah, you may know. And we thank everyone for their um, interest, enthusiasm. It's always uh, reassuring to us to know that the public cares about the historic fabric of this city um, as we are stewards of that. So it's great to have that and thank you. Um, if there are people in attendance who did not submit a letter or have something in addition to uh, the letter or email that they sent, um, we'd be happy to hear from them. Um, but we need to keep this brief because we do have to deliberate and make decision about this. So I'm happy to take, uh, again, any, any additional public comment, it, please state your name and your address. All right. If there's um, can, no I, can, I say, can I say one thing, Martha? I just, I, the public may not know that um, the Sarah did send the commission everybody on the commission, the links to those letters, That's which right. so we were able to see them and read them as well, that yes. were sent to the CPC. Yes. And that was very helpful. It was very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, if there's no more comment, um, I would like to just have the, um, oh, so Deborah. I guess I'm sorry, Martha, that, that I don't want to slow things down, but I, I want to just clarify. So you are asking for comment primarily or exclusively from people who have not written in. Right, we have, you know, we have people's letters of support or opposition. So if it's someone who's not able to do that, um, you're welcome to speak here publicly. Um, or again, if you have comments that were not voiced in your initial communication with the planning office, um, we're, well, we're happy to hear those as well. Okay, and the second thing I wanted to ask for clarification is, I know some of the letters were sent to historic commission and you said you received you thought over 40 but sarah would probably have that number i just wondered if we could get that number um, i counted the ones that i got so that was my total yeah. but there may be more what we, what we were told by sarah because there was a misunderstanding of where the letters were supposed to be sent for the historic commission and so i think i was part of the problem of the misinformation of giving out your email and so then when sarah said no we redirected people. So I'm hoping that other people sent them where they were supposed to, my fault in the whole era, and I apologize for that. But I just wondered if we had an account since we were, this letter seemed to be a big deal, so. 
they're, they're all in the same file, uh, whether they, no matter who they were sent to. So if you wanted to take okay. a peek, you could, you could uh, download them all or count them. I, I don't, I didn't count them. So I, I don't yeah. know how many were submitted, okay. but it was quite a few. Okay, great. Any other um, hands out there? Let's see, anybody else that would like to say anything? Okay, um, we do have the applicant here as well as the preservation consultant. And I think it would be really helpful for us to um, hear from you. Um, just an overview of where the project is. I know Matt, we, um, we've we seen uh, the uh, recent, I guess the most recent drawings that you have, Sarah sent those around. And then Mark, we did, as I mentioned, we're able to read your report. Thank you for that. Um, um, but if you could maybe just update us, that would be very helpful. Sure. Before, um, before that starts, could I just say one thing? There was a link, which I meant to ask Sarah about, that I couldn't open, which was maybe the plans um, for the exterior, maybe including where the ramp would be or thing. And it was, it was, I couldn't open that link. So I don't know if it's possible to share those during this presentation. Yeah, was if that that's... The, was that the link that was at the end of Sarah's email message? I think so, maybe at the end of the staff report. Yes. And yeah, I and I couldn't find it. The... It wouldn't open on my computer. Okay. I was able to open it, and I believe it was the CP. It was the CPC application, correct, Sarah? Uh, there were there were two. There were so I believe okay. I provided a yeah, link. I'm sorry, I just didn't have a chance set to of plans. Um, which if Mark sure. doesn't have that in his presentation, I can put them up on the screen as well as the CPA application, which I know people had reviewed previously. Thank as well. you. Okay. Matt or Mark and or Mark. Sure. So I so I'll give a, a quick quick introduction. Thanks, Martha. Thanks for the rest of the commission. Uh, my name is Matt Welter, Vice President of uh, Development for O'Connell Development Group. Um, this has been uh, an iterative process, um, an ongoing process. This request, uh, as you mentioned, Martha, came out of, I believe, an April 20th, uh, 2022 CPC meeting where there was um, an interest in receiving a historical structure report um, to, to be issued, and our firm uh, hired Mark Thaler, um, he can provide an introduction, but he's a, a partner at Thaler Riley Wilson, um, preservation consultant uh, based on Albany and um, authored the, the report. Uh, there's also an abridged summary presentation that we'd like to present as well. Um, in terms of the, the plans and the elevations, those were developed uh, prior to the April meeting. And um, since then, we've not advanced the design further, knowing that uh, we'd like to get mass historic uh, feedback and understand some of their concerns. And I think maybe limitations so that we can we can follow and fully comply with those, those restrictions. So um, I would, would guess um, what's been shown in the elevation is absolutely in spirit of what we intend to construct. Um, it's a 10 unit multifamily project, um, but with the one caveat that we're, we're uh, pending further guidance and comment from Mass Historic. Great, thank you. So Mark, are you, would you like to share anything with us? Sure. So <clears throat> um, we do have a uh, little um, PowerPoint that we can show, uh, show Great. some of the issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Can everyone see that? Do they see a PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Okay. So I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, background. <clears throat> a church was uh, constructed in 1913. <coughs> 
I apologize. As um, many churches, you know, it underwent uh, a number of interior renovations. Um, the original decoration in the church um, was redone in 1954. 1958, the wainscot was added. 1966, <clears throat> after the Vatican II, everything was quote unquote whitewashed, so it was much more simplified. Then in 1986, you know, again, the, the church was redecorated. So much of what was there in terms of the uh, interiors that, you know, people might be familiar with actually are not all that old. Uh, they're only uh, 30 plus years old. Um, in 2010, the, the parish then merged with Sacred Heart Parish. And then was, the building was subsequently desanctified. Most of the stained glass and statuary was removed. And in 2020, the, the diocese sold the property to O'Connell Development. Um, and so, of course, Matt was just talking about, you know, they're just in the beginning stages now of developing plans uh, for residential apartments within the building. And uh, I must say, as a, as a complete aside, uh, that doesn't relate specifically to St. John Cantius, but um, I've dealt with historic properties my entire career. My, my, I got into it. My thesis project in school was actually the adaptive reuse of a spectacular church in my own hometown. And <clears throat> unfortunately, the building wasn't adaptively reused. No new function was ever found. And ultimately, this spectacular building, you know, came down. So I am very sensitive to finding new uses that really respect these these buildings. So when you know we were approached to to do this report, you know, it was really in that in that spirit. So <clears throat> the plan of the building uh, as it currently exists, this is on the right hand side is Holly Street. On the top is is Phillips Place. Um, so as you would expect, you know, you come into a vestibule or a narthex uh, at, at the front. <clears throat> then you enter underneath, underneath a balcony into a nave space, one large volume. And uh, this, the sanctuary is, is at the far end. There is a sacristy, which is basically like a robing room um, in the uh, lower left-hand corner, uh, along with an entry vestibule uh, from the side. And then there's a storage room uh, off on the, on the upper left. So <clears throat> the things that are, in our mind, really the most significant uh, about this building in terms of the historic district in which it sits is really the exterior. It, it is a an impressive, you know, Romanesque uh, revival building. Um, it really maintains, you know, its characteristic volumes. Um, you know, the the round arched uh, windows, the the campanile, um, the brick and terracotta work uh, are really quite spectacular, and um, you know clearly in in our mind uh, as part of the redevelopment <clears throat> we would expect to see you know the vast majority of that kept you know to the extent it can while you're still uh, you know adaptively reusing the building so as uh, as a sort of guideline you know really what um, you know we see is you know you have two very main public facades, the, the Holly Street facade on the west and, and the Phillips Place on, on the south. Um, and again, to the extent possible, you know, we would definitely see these facades as remaining as, as intact as possible. 
the other two facades are much less visible uh, to the public. Uh, the rear facade is really um, quite unremarkable. You know, it just has a few windows um, at, at the uh, ground floor level. And, you know, the other side simply isn't uh, on, the, on the north, isn't really going to be visible to anyone other than, you know, the, the folks that live in, in the apartments that are right there. So if there need to be any changes to the volume, it would make more sense to do it on these facades than on the, on the primary facades. <clears throat> we looked at the roofing and, um, you know, on the Campanile, uh, you know, really the only thing that we could see that was, was from drone footage and, you know, the, um, the tile appears to be in relatively good condition there. Um, but the red slate roof, which is the main roof of the building is really in quite poor condition. Uh, there are many, many, many slates that, um, have been lost over time. Uh, it really appears to be, you know, not just simply due to the age of the slate and, and weathering of the slate, but also, you know, you get to a certain point in time and, and the fasteners also begin to go. So <clears throat> we understand that that, that is a serious issue that will have to be addressed. The, um, the cupola that you see here uh, in, the, in the foreground on the right, uh, you know, is basically, you know, a, a painted uh, turn for the most part with, with a copper uh, cupola on top. Uh, you also have some minor roofs um, you, you know, on the um, on the left. You see a view of the uh, South Chapel roof uh, that still retains slates. You can see many of them are are dislodged and off. Uh, the same thing is true for the North Chapel roof. Uh, this little storeroom roof also has slates that are out. And then the sacristy roof actually was a red asphalt shingle uh, roof that was put on quite some time ago. And <clears throat> that also has really uh, at the end of its, its life as well. And, you know, hence, because the roofing is, is going, you know, it's, it's causing uh, damage inside the building. So, um, you know, you can see on the left, uh, this happens to be on the south side of the nave, you know, quite a bit of plaster damage from, from leaks. Um, and, you know, what happens is you have this barrel vaulted plaster ceiling, which is within this, you know, wood framed gabled uh, roof. So there's a space and wherever the leak happens to occur, you know, in the, in the roof above, you know, it drips down and then finds its way to some other spot within the ceiling where, um, you know, the, the water begins to, to come out. So in the center, you know, you can see this happens to be on the north side of the nave. <clears throat> some of the paint damage actually is showing some of the earlier decorative painting that was there previously all sort of flaking off. And then uh, where you have the north vestibule roof and the sacristy area, um, you know, that that has both a uh, section of flat roof as well as that asphalt shingle that we just looked at. And that area is leaking and, you know, causing quite a bit of damage uh, in that area of the building as well. The gutters and downspouts all need to be replaced. Um, you know, you can see on the left that happens to be, a, you know, a, a more modern downspout that was there, no longer attached, you know, part of it came out. Um, but pretty typical are uh, what you see in the, in the right hand where, you know, the gutter, uh, you know, they get clogged, they, they build up ice, uh, and then they start to sag in the middle. So now you begin to have water you know, overflowing, draining onto the masonry, causing, causing damage to the masonry. <clears throat> and hence, you know, you see in many areas, um, 
and really it's almost always related to uh, you know water uh, damage from uh, from these gutters and downspouts where you know we have areas that need to be repointed um, we have areas of masonry that um, you know, uh, you have biologic growth that, you know, should be cleaned as well as repointed. Generally speaking, where the, uh, you know, the vast majority of the brickwork, and that's really sort of evident in uh, the right-hand photograph when you're not looking at the, at the little piece there, but the, the main body of the building, you know, the, generally speaking, the mortar is in good condition. Again, it's a lot of isolated areas, but it adds up. It's certainly something that is going to have to be addressed. The terracotta uh, is what you see as all of these uh, buff colored bands. So that's actually not limestone. Uh, it's all uh, terracotta and in surprisingly good condition for the most part. Um, there are areas that uh, there are some damage um, elements, but for the most part, it has held up extraordinarily well. Um, what absolutely has to happen, though, is um, you know those open joints need to be uh, repointed. And you can see um, in the image on the right, uh, especially up high, where you have um, you know a lot of wind and wind driven rain you know it, it really uh does havoc on on some of these especially these horizontal joints and you know once that water begins to get in there you know it can really sort of blow apart some of this terracotta so it's really the sort of the perfect time to to be able to get to this building and and you know make sure that it that it doesn't deteriorate um Certainly, you know, some of the entry doors you see like on the left, um, you know, need restoration. There, there's a fair amount of uh, damage to to a number of them. Um, and some of the remaining windows, most of which are, you know, small uh, double hung windows uh, that were never stained glass. You know, some of those windows will, will also require repair. Um, but all of the large stained glass windows with the exception of the rose window was, were all removed, you know, by the diocese uh, before O'Connell had uh, purchased the, the building. So at the moment, those are just sort of large, um, you know, usually translucent uh, glazing panels that, that were put in. Um, so those would all be, you know, part of what, you know, falls into the apartments. Um, so, and any stained glass that does still remain in the building, which generally speaking is the rose window and some of the uh, smaller uh, stained glass windows at, at the main entry vestibule, uh, you know, those uh, we would suggest uh, remain. At the main entry, um, sort of interesting, and I hadn't been able to find a photo that was really clear from day one, um, but this particular little bracket piece that comes out at the, uh, at the entry definitely appears to be uh, a slightly later element than original, and it's all constructed out of wood, which is all rotted. Um, so, you know, they have, um, you know, these, these large brackets and dentals above, uh, there's a, uh, a copper roof over this, uh, area, uh, which is in reasonable shape, but all of the woodwork, uh, you know, there will have to be redone. Um, the, the columns actually that you see the, the top of, um, on the left actually is a limestone column, um, unlike all the other areas where, you know, they, they use terracotta instead. So it all makes me think, you know, that that's sort of a later element um, at any rate. The, um, the entry steps themselves 
uh, are granite. They they certainly look like they probably date from uh, renovations of the 50s, and you know the there's quite a few open joints that'll have to be addressed there. You know they have a sort of mid-century um, aluminum railing uh, system that that's attached there. Uh, this is the area that if they needed to, you know, put a, a new entry ramp, uh, an accessible ramp to bring uh, folks into the main entrance here, it would make sense to simply pull this out and widen that that landing to to be able to accomplish that. And then some of the interior elements, we, we certainly understand that you know, the building is going to have to be heavily modified to, you know, be able to accommodate uh, apartments. But the, um, you know, some of the architectural features, you know, I think are really uh, things that are that are worth keeping and, and will, you know, provide a lot of charm to, uh, you know, the interior of this building as, as it's redeveloped, you know, including uh, the door on the left, you know, you see this, you know, very ornate, uh, architrave over that, and then the vestibule where where you have those stained glass windows and and the uh, uh, the wainscoting. So, our recommendations uh, from the historic structure report is, is really, you know, to maintain the historic appearance of the exterior to the greatest degree possible. Um, we know that there will have to be changes. Um, you know, to maintain the existing massing and fenestration uh, patterns. Um, and, you know, where things need to be changed, they should really be sympathetic. You know, for instance, all of the, the arches, you know, on the windows, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, ultimately, it's going to be, you know, uh, O'Connell working with, you know, Mass Historic to uh, see exactly what those interventions uh, want to look like. Uh, there's going to be, you know, uh, cleaning and, and repointing of historic brick and uh, terracotta. That should really be done uh, with a replacement mortar, which matches the original mortar properties in terms of strength, vapor permeability, and appearance. Um, and, you know, where there are damaged uh, terracotta elements, um, you know, those should be repaired and, and matched to uh, the original condition. Uh, the red shingle or the red slate shingles, uh, we understand are a very uh, pricey thing. We don't know whether they're, you know, it's going to be economically viable to to reuse some of them. We haven't been able to really assess whether that's even uh, viable from a technical standpoint. So, you know, it might be uh, sensible to go back with red synthetic slate or even a red asphalt <clears throat> shingle once you're at any distance, you know, it, it will give the same appearance from, from a distance. Uh, replacing metal gutters and downspouts is really going to be necessary to uh, address the water infiltration areas. Repairing the, the wood entry canopy, um, we just looked at, you know, maintaining the stained glass windows, restoring the existing doors, except where you need to address egress and accessibility issues. Um, and, you know, widening that existing entry landing if, if we need to create a front uh, accessible entry. And on the interior, you know, really trying to maintain as much of the historic fabric and detailing as is practical, practicable on, for the interior as those departments or apartments are, are developed. So the, those are really the recommendations of the historic structure report and ultimately um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, Matt uh, will have to consider and, and see how that jives with, with how the building can, can function. So I don't know if this is the correct time or Matt, if you want to say something. Thanks, Mark. Um, no, just to, to, to add um, to some of your points, Mark, uh, we're absolutely some, uh, sympathetic to the the interior and the, the the past materials that were used, but we are dealing with kind of in this age 
um, severe supply chain issues and um, general availability becomes um, a really pressing issue. So, um, you know, to the extent uh, some of the materials can be used to match, um, we, we would explore those, but with the roof materials specifically, um, all of our feedback from, from vendors, from contractors, um, kind of point us to the direction that uh, lead times and availability for slate and sy synthetic slate is, is, is very difficult. Um, so um, we would, you know, like to match the, the I think the, the spirit of the look and to, to match to the extent possible, but to understand, you know, there are some, some market forces that are kind of working against us. So um, that, that's kind of the, the general context that, that we're working in. Okay, thank you, um, both of you. Mark, that was excellent presentation, very clear. It was very helpful. Uh, Barbara and Harvey, do you have questions for Mark or Matt or comments? So I also was not able to see the, the CPE application. Um, so I don't, I don't have a very good sense of what um, the plans are. I thought that the recommendations that Mark just made all seemed great to me. Yeah, so that would be one question, Matt, is um, you talked about the roof. I mean, are you, um, what are your intentions with the recommendations of the HSR at this point, or do you not know? Um, don't know yet. Um, we had hard priced for an architectural asphalt shingle. Um, so that was where we were in, intending to, to, to make the repair in, in, into that material type. And that was really to you know, shore up the building as quickly as possible, knowing what constraints we were working with. And that was the, the most economically viable. And um, I would say from a market standpoint, the most available. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where we were, we were headed. But the other elements, the gutters, the downspouts, the terracotta, um, the those are wall. consistent with what we were we were planning to repair. Okay. Um, and the what about the handicap entrance and this granite steps? And that is that not has that been thought through yet? Uh, to the extent of uh, Mark's kind of approach, that's uh, in line with how we would we would try to to salvage the the uh, that front entrance and then you know just make it handicap accessible so we, we would try to to save as much as possible um, and just make it um, handicap accessible mm -hmm. okay Barbara um, I, I think it was somewhere in this either in you know, in the report or the recommendations it, it mentioned um, potentially adding other windows to the exterior into for, for servicing the apartments, but do you know, have any sense of where those would be and how many? And, you know, I'm assuming you, I mean, I would hope that you would try and make them look like the other windows in terms of being arched or whatever, but, but how much of a change, how much of a change in the exterior do you foresee at this point? So Mark, you can, you can jump in on kind of, um, the, the kind of the style and the amount of penetration, but uh, really the the new the new windows would be simply I, I think on on the on the public facing facades would be fairly limited, but knowing that we do have a loft condition that we're trying to to create for for mm -hmm. future tenants, so we do need that that natural light on the second floor. So we would look to add some level of new windows above the arched windows, I believe on the, on the north and um, south elevation. Um, and then on the, on the rear of the, the building, right now it's, it's almost windowless. Um, you see some openings on the ground floor, but to, to make it truly livable and rentable, we do need to add more windows there. So that's, that's more of a TBD. Um, but you know, we would be looking to add probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 12, I would say, windows on that on the rear side of the building, which is 
the the least uh, public facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, I know one of the things that you know Matt was looking at was <clears throat> where those little side chapels are. For instance, you know, there's just a couple of little slit windows that are up, you know, fairly high, and you know, those are going to be, you know, in someone's apartment there. So, um, and, and in a fairly wide area of the apartment. So the thought was, well, perhaps, you know, if you just simply took that opening and, and brought it down. So, you know, it became this much longer, you know, uh, opening, you know, it'd still f feel like, you know, it, it belonged there. So, you know, there are certainly ways that you can, you know, modify some of those openings without, you know, making the building look wrong. You know, it, you, it can really work. And, you know, certainly in those back areas, especially, you know, you could put windows all over that back facade, you know, and as long as they were sort of, you know, symmetrical and everything else, you know, it, it would look perfectly normal, so. It might actually improve the look of it. It would. <laughs> Barbara, do you have any other thoughts or Harvey, either of you? Nothing at this time. Okay. I, I really appreciated um, you reaching out to um, Thayer Riley Wilson, um, I think this was such a helpful document for us mm -hmm. to have. And I think the CPC will really appreciate this a lot. Um, it's exactly what they needed. And um, I, I guess at this point, I feel, I feel pretty comfortable moving ahead with supporting an application um, if this approach is taken. Uh, just you know what's been laid out here, what Mark has observed to us, um, I think the fenestration is really important and you do state this in the recommendation pretty clearly. And I'm not saying that I think it has to be preserved as is. Um, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to make this building even better, but it has to be done sensitively. And I, I like the approach that um, you're thinking of. I think it, it, it has a lot of promise for doing that if it's handled right. Um, so in that regard, I, I would feel uh, comfortable moving ahead with support. And again, just because we have really good um, documentation and some really, really strong direction. Um, Matt, I, I had not heard before um, you, and maybe I wasn't present or was thinking about something else, um, talk about uh, working with MHC on this. So did that kind of evolve as the uh, negotiations or thoughts about the preservation restriction um, developed? I'm sorry, could you, uh, maybe I'm just not familiar with all the acronyms. Um, oh, that's okay. No, you had mentioned a couple of times tonight um, that you were planning on um, doing some back and forth with Mass Historical on what you're proposing. Yes, that's right. And I hadn't heard that in any of the pre previous presentations, even with CPC, Community Preservation Committee, that is. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that, um, how that evolved and what your intentions are? Sure. So, um, you know, it may have uh, candidly came, you know, come from a, a point of just not understanding the entire process, um, mm -hmm. but becoming more educated and informed on the process and uh, kind of understanding the the uh, the requirements and the input that's going to be required um, has kind of put that more kind of front of mind. And so, if that was not um, raised earlier, it was it was more of an oversight than kind mm -hmm. of an intentional, um, you know, trying to skirt any type of responsibility. So. We would absolutely look to uh, Mass Historic and getting their feedback, starting a conversation on, you know, I think uh, one of their reviewers and and get some some early some early feedback to understand what they're looking for and so that we can incorporate that rather than you know committing to uh, you know full level of of construction documents and have you know kind of have to to, to re-engineer or to redesign. So yeah, um, the the intention is is to absolutely plug them in early in the process, 
have them opine on, on our approach. And, and essentially, if, if there's consensus, then uh, we, would, we would look to move forward and execute on that plan. Okay. And so is, is also your plan to um, keep the preservation architects involved or? Yes. Okay. To kind of help you through that process with Mass yes. Historic? Great. Okay. So that gives me even more reassurance. <laughs> um, okay, so Barbara and Harvey, here we are, the three of us. Um, do you feel? Do you have any more com comments, questions? Um, we need. We are going to vote on this tonight, so it's a two-part vote. One is to support voice support for the application to be put forth to community preservation, and that will not happen until the fall. Um, and, and again, just to remind everybody, uh, we are not, we're just supporting it. The Community Preservation Committee will make that decision. Actually, City Council will, I should say, but the committee will uh, look at it and make a recommendation. Um, and then the second is about the preservation um, restriction and whether we uh, support a preservation restriction being um, applied to the project in perpetuity. So we can vote on them individually, or we can vote on them as a package. Can I just ask, sorry, this is Deborah Berkovitz. Um, you asked for comments before, but it, there, so there's no opportunity after the presentation to be making any comments or ask questions? Um, we, we could take a few questions, but we need to, um, do you have questions for the commission or for the applicants or? Yeah, I guess I'm just not understanding in terms of the order of things. I mean, depending, this was a great report, um, but to depend, there's a lot of vagueness about the design elements and um, to, to kind of hope for sensitivity when, from my perspective, the buildings that were put up next to the church are about as insensitive as possible architecturally in context with that neighborhood seems like I don't understand why you would be in a position to vote to approve this without actually having a design committed to um, you know very specifically not we hope to and we will because um, that often in the face of there there's a lot of outs oh we couldn't get the materials oh we changed our design oh when we were you know doing things it seemed like it was too difficult it feels like as from the historical commission perspective if you're if this process is about looking for commitment to uh, you know to do maintaining sensitivity I don't see a good track record and I don't understand why you wouldn't need more detail at this point uh, before you would be approving this. So we, that was my statement about uh, keeping the preservation architects involved and about uh, negotiating with Mass Historic who will be negotiating with the developer uh, on the terms of the preservation restriction. And I, I'm just saying I'm much more comfortable with the approach uh, knowing that the preservation architects who are excellent and um, that's historical will be evolved moving forward. Um, I have a question again, because uh, Carvey, I was not able to look at the, um, um, I apologize, I, I couldn't look at the um, CPA application, but the funds that O'Connor was asking for are to essentially preserve the envelope of the building, that's my understanding. So at this point, it wouldn't include or maybe and what I'm asking is at this point, would it include changing any windows or you know, either adding or taking away any windows or would that happen in a later stage once their plans developed more fully for um, converting this to um, uh, apartments? So essentially would, their pres would the preservation be basically um, repairing things uh, closing the envelope, the, the building's envelope, basically as is. And I understand some of the materials might change if, ne if necessary, but essentially the, the design or the elements would be preserved for now. That's what um, I'd like to know. Sarah, you... Matt, maybe you could just give a quick overview of the limited um, elements that were 
uh, part of the CPA application for that five hundred thousand? Sure. So the 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 items uh, kind of from a, a budget breakdown, the the five hundred thousand that we're asking for would essentially only apply to repointing and uh, fixing the masonry um, envelope and then a replacement of the roof. So the the funds would not be used to um, replace windows. Uh, that would be completely on our own on, on O'Connell's own dollar. Um, so this is purely for, um, I think, stopping and stemming the the water infiltration. It's the it's the repointing in the roof. Um, also, sir, I have a question too, um, and maybe this is sort of related to your Deborah. What you were saying is, um, is the Central Business Architecture Committee involved still in this process? So there's a pending application for demolition of the structure, and that's okay. been continued several times to allow for the Community Preservation Committee to review okay. the application. So if, um, let's say the application goes through and the building is preserved, will CBAC um, be involved in reviewing designs for it at all? Uh, it would depend on whether anything that's proposed would trigger central business review. It would definitely need a, a modified application at the very least. Okay. So it will be in the hands of another committee um, if the funding is approved. It would, it would also be my understanding that if there were a preservation restriction on the building that, that, that CPA often requires, um, that that would address um, changes and maybe they would call them significant or, or identify what kind of changes would trigger either a review or would or would not be acceptable um, uh, so that um, Mass Historic or whoever held the preservation restriction would have the ability to review things before they happened or look at materials before they're used. Is, is that true also? Yeah, that's correct. So the historic preservation restriction would be held uh, by the city in care and custody of the historic commission. Mass historic is involved because um, in order for this to be a permanent restriction, that agency is required by law to sign off. Um, you know, and and it has to meet uh, certain requirements before mass historic is willing to do that. So it's important that they get involved. Uh, but the restriction will certainly provide the city with a level of review that certainly doesn't exist now. Uh, Claudia, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I just want to echo what Deborah said and just clarify. Essentially, you're saying the historic commission that the building is worth the envelope is worth saving, and your mandate is not to balance whether the cost of saving it or is is worth it. My concern is that if they proceed very, very carefully and do a very good job, the price in the end for the apartments is going to go up and up and up and drive up you know, the housing cost. So there's somehow, I'm just wondering because I think your recommendation on this will be quite significant. So I'm just curious if you can tell me how you're thinking about this in terms of, yes, you see the building as you know, as historic, and you want it to be preserved at any cost. Is is that what the vote essentially will say? And then, what about the cost to the community of then the housing and so forth? Thanks. Right. So I think that um, again, you have to really the community preservation committee is going to be reviewing this project um, against um, a, a different set of criteria. Or, or I should say a more expansive set of criteria. So we are not just looking at, um, is this a historic building that's important to the community or is architecturally significant? There are many other factors that go into the CPC decisions. And um, th that criteria is available on the city website um, through the community preservation page, I'm sure. And you can look at that and see. So they, um, of course, will be talking about the pros and cons of um, how the city's funds are being spent. Our job in this, I think, is to say to the 
CPC, we support this. Um, if the city, if the city so chooses to put money into this, um, we want to be sure that the money is um, the, the investment is protected, and the investment that's made is uh, following the tech Secretary of the Interior standards. And thus, you know, you have a preservation architect involved, you have Mass Historical involved to help um, reassure the city that what's being done is in keeping with standards. Okay. Okay. Thanks. But yeah, the Community Preservation Committee will take this up and I'm sure there'll be, it's a big committee. There are a lot of applications and um, there'll be a lot of discussion. Uh, again, keeping the other criteria in mind, you know, weighing those as well. Fred, your hand is up. Yes, uh, thank you for having this meeting. and. Uh, I just have a quick question. I want to verify that what I heard was correct. And that is the preservation restriction will be held by the city and by our historic commission. Is that correct? It's held by the city and the, uh, the, um, the, the historic commission will act on behalf of the city. And by the historic commission, we're talking about historic Northampton or MHP? No, the, this commission that you're uh, that is meeting tonight. Historic Northampton is a private nonprofit organization that is a collecting organization and programming organization. We are a public entity. This commission, the historical commission. Oh right, thank you. Yeah, sure. A lot of people get that confused. <laughs> Are there other comments, questions? Harvey and Barbara, do you feel um, comfortable voting on this at this point? Were all of your questions answered? Well, I, I do just as long as, so just to be clear that what we're voting is that we support the application as long as it does more or less follow the recommendations of this report. Correct. And then the restriction is the second part. Okay, then if one of you would please um, make a motion. I prefer for Barbara to articulate it. <laughs> okay, I'll try it. Let me see if I can do this. So I, uh, I uh, present a motion to support the uh, O'Connell's application for funds from the CPA for um, the uh, preservation of the exterior of the St. John Cantus building, provided that they follow the guidelines that were presented in the structural, structural report, which the CPC requested, and also providing that there is a preservation restric restriction crafted with Mass Historic, a Mass Historical Commission, or is Mass, Master Commission to be held by the city um, with the Northampton Historical Commission acting essentially as the, as the agent of that restriction. I think that covers I, everything. I second that motion. <laughs> Probably can't repeat it, you say. No, but I'm glad I didn't. I couldn't to. repeat it either, but Sarah has it down, I'm sure. So the, I guess I just want to be clear in that, and I think it is clear, but I'm going to ask you both again, if you think that agree with me, um, that we are, um, I don't know if insistent is a strong, too strong a word, but we are, um, we're insistent that the uh, recommendations of the HSR be followed yes. as part of the, as part of our support yes. um, with the guidance of the preservation architect and Mass Historic. Yes, thank you for adding that in. Um, that's a con I, I don't know if you can call it a condition. Yeah, that, I would but it consider could be a that condition. a condition. Condition. I would consider that another condition. Yeah. Of our support. Okay. Is that okay, Sarah? Sure. Yeah, I've got that. Okay. Great. All right. I think we're um, we're ready to to vote. Unless there are any other comments from Barbara or Harvey. Okay. All right. So roll call vote. Harvey. Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Martha? Yes. Great, unanimous. Thank you again, uh, Matt and Mark.
Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. And I just, again, as the historic preser historical commission's representative to this community mm -hmm. preservation committee, um, when we do meet in the fall to review this, I would really encourage you um, bringing, you know, coming to the, you know, when you when you you present your application, I, I think it's going to be important to ha have Mark involved in that because um, there were a lot of questions about um, preservation uh, so from that committee. Just a bit of advice. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. All right, is there any other business that was not foreseen when the agenda was prepared? Not for me. Okay. So we will meet again um, in, what is to, today? Will we meet at the end of August, Sarah, or? Will uh, we, we will. Uh, so we do have a few things on the agenda already. So August 29th will be the next meeting and that's the, the regularly scheduled last Monday of the month. Okay, great. And I, I, I already know that I probably won't be here. I won't be available that day. Um, but. Yeah, I was just. Is, is that uh, the Monday? Is that the Monday where the next Monday is Labor Day? A week from there is. Uh, Day? If, yes, if Labor Day is the the fifth, that would be a week before Labor Day. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I will not be here on the 29th. I mean, it's possible I will, but at the moment I'm scheduled not to be. Okay. Okay. Well, I can check, and if we need to figure out an alternate date, mm -hmm. we'll work on that. Uh, one thing I was just going to mention is, um, before we adjourn, that this process we've gone through um, with St. John Canius, I think, um, is a, has been a real, uh, it's, a, it's been very instructional for me. And I think um, when, as the, we get more applications in front of us for preser preserving either privately owned or publicly owned buildings, mm -hmm. historic buildings, I think um, this is been a great model and I would like to see this continue um, with future applications and especially if applicants are coming to um, obtain C CPA funding. I think it's going to be critical and that they, you know, present for us. Um, they have an HSR done. Um, it's been good. This is where we really fell down on the Michelson gallery and uh, I don't think I don't think the historical commission was really involved in that, but um, it was you know it would have been critical to get that project right. They they actually um, gave their money back, so it did matter in the end anyway. But it would have been critical to get that right. So okay, um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn at six fifty three. Okay, so moved. Good night to all. Good night. And thank you everyone Bye -bye. that um that that appeared and also sent in your letters. It was uh, very helpful to us. Thank you all as well. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.